Good afternoon. My name is Arlen Lewis and I'm a partner in the Birmingham, Alabama Office of Blueprint Construction Council. I'm the chair of the ABA Forum on Construction Law. And on behalf of the forum, I wanna welcome you to another installment of the forum's monthly diversity and inclusion brunch series. In February, 2021, the forum received the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Champions Award from the ABA Commission on Racial and Ethnic Diversity in the Profession for the development and implementation of this series of discussions. Accordingly, I can proudly welcome you to the award-winning Diversity and Inclusion Brunch Series, featuring Patricia Candamo of Candamo Law and Clara rodriguez Rakusek of Rakusek Law. Now, the ABA Forum on Construction Law is the largest organization of construction lawyers in the world and serves as a thought resource to the construction industry. Diversity and inclusion is a priority for the forum, and we consistently take action to enhance participation, inclusion, and leadership opportunities for attorneys of diverse backgrounds through our forum programs, publications, and other initiatives. Now, the forum offers several scholarships, fellowships, and leadership development programs to enhance diversity among construction lawyers. If you are not yet a member of the forum or an affiliate, I encourage you to join our organization and participate more fully in our ongoing programs to support the construction industry. You can do so by going to AmericanBar.org and looking for construction law. Now, on a broader scale, the forum is committed to raising awareness and understanding of the vital role diversity plays in the construction industry. For many years, the forum has featured a broad spectrum of prominent keynote diversity speakers at each of its national meetings, ranging from civil rights lawyer, Fred Gray, to Nobel laureate, Stephen Chu, to the right honorable Beverly McLaughlin, the first woman to serve as chief justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, and Vicki O'Leary, an iron worker and 2019 ENR Award of Excellence winner for her efforts to combat harassment on construction project sites. Recently, the forum dedicated one of its national meetings exclusively to issues of diversity, inclusion, and professionalism within the construction industry. Now, at the core of the forum are the principles of respect, professionalism, inclusion, and collegiality. In addition to race, gender, ethnicity, and other categories traditionally associated with diversity and inclusion, we also value the diversity of ideas, perspectives, and opinions. Accordingly, through the Diversity and Inclusion Brunch series, we feature a one hour conversation with keynote speakers who provide insight into issues of diversity, inclusion, construction, and the legal industry. The brunches are held at 1 p.m. Eastern on the third Thursday of each month. These programs are free and open to all members of the forum, friends, clients, and anyone else who's interested. Pre-registration is required so mark your calendars and stay tuned for announcements containing registration details. We'd like to thank Nick Holmes, chair of the forum's diversity and inclusion committee for his support in the development of this series. We'd also like to thank Tamara Harrington, LaShonda Williams, Colleen Hardison, and all of our forum staff for helping to make this program a reality. Now with that, let's get into our session and I look forward to introducing you to the person principally responsible for organizing today's session, John Vento, who is a shareholder at Trenum. John, it's all yours. Todos bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone. I'm very happy to have uh, with us today two very interesting attorneys here in Tampa who have been very active in the Hispanic community. In fact, um, uh, both of them have been presidents, one is current president and uh, past presidents twice of our Hispanic, uh, Tampa Bay Hispanic Bar Association. So I want to introduce you to Clara uh, Rodriguez Rokusek. Clara was born in Colombia and she moved to the U.S. in 1991 as a nine-year-old. Uh, she earned a Bachelor of Business and a Bachelor of Arts from Stetson University in DeLand, also proudly known as the Hatters, right, Clara? That's correct. And from, Stets, from Stetson Hats. And she obtained her Juris Doctor degree from Stetson University College of Law. 
and uh, became a licensed Florida attorney in 2008. In 2010, she started her own law firm, Rokusik Law, where she focuses in the areas of real estate law, consumer debt collection, and bankruptcy. Also with us today is the current president of the Tampa Bay Hispanic Bar Association, uh, Patricia uh, Ann Condamo. And uh, Trish was born uh, in Pennsylvania. Her family heritage is actually the Czech Republic, but she earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh. And while there, she studied at the University of Magala in Spain, where she became absolutely fluent in Spanish, to which I can attest. Uh, she's obtained her Juris Doctor degree from Stetson University College of Law in 2010. And in 2015, after working for several large firms, she started her own firm, Condamo Law, focusing her practice areas in business litigation, construction, and criminal defense. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, as you saw from the title of our program, challenges and cultural differences in representing Hispanic clients and the future of the practice and priorities for progress. And particularly what we think we can do at the end, we'll discuss uh, as um, members of the bar and as active participants in bar associations to advance um, you know, justice for Hispanic clients in our courts. Um, so first I wanna ask a little bit about background. Uh, Clara, what um, made you decide to become a lawyer? Very good question. My decision to become an attorney came about when my parents were helped by an immigration attorney uh, back in the early 90s. Um, and that immigration attorney actually helped us become permanent residents and basically gave us the keys to this land of opportunity. And I just remember seeing my clients so happy at, the, uh, at what this attorney had done. And, and in my mind, I just wanted to have that effect in that and be able to provide that kind of help to others. So I bet your parents were thrilled. And I think you told me the story. They had to actually leave the United States and then come back to the United States. Is that right? That's correct. We drove all the way from Florida to pa El Paso, Texas. And for some reason, I don't do immigration law. Um, we had to uh, do a quick in and out. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, and uh, Trish, what uh, made you decide to become a lawyer? When I was about 14 years old, I attended the National Youth Leadership Forum on Law and the Constitution at American University in Washington, DC. They gave us short fact patterns and we got to make arguments on both sides. And from that day, I knew that that's exactly what I wanted to do. It was very interesting and I wanted to be a lawyer. Well, let me ask you a, a more fascinating question, which is, uh, what made you uh, decide to have virtually an entirely 100% Hispanic clientele? My husband is Venezuelan, so, and I studied abroad in Spain, so I speak Spanish, and the need was here in our community. I see a lot of Hispanic clients that don't understand, they don't have someone to speak their language to them and help them navigate the court system. So it's just such a need here in our community that I was able to help by being able to understand them and speak their language and assist them through the process. And Clara, is your practice also primarily with, uh, with Hispanic clients? That's correct, John. Um, I would say 80% of my clients are Spanish speakers. I use Spanish every single day in my daily life as an attorney. Um, a lot of our forms, as you can imagine, are in both languages, retainers, letters, uh, questionnaires people need to fill out. All of my staff speak Spanish. It's, uh, it's become uh, sort of like practicing in another country just because the need in our area here in Tampa is so vast that people are looking for a Spanish speaking attorney and we are here thankfully to provide that service. And speaking of forms, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what the Hispanic uh, Tampa Bay Hispanic Bar Association has been doing, particularly with uh, Clara, our forms clinic, which I know you've been active in, and so is, is Trish. Yes, the Tampa Hispanic Bar Association started a great program. My predecessor started it, so this was prior to 2011, and the forms clinic helps those individuals who want to file for divorce, um, simple family law matters, even a name change. And pro bono attorneys 
take the time to help individuals out. A lot of Hispanic uh, clients go, obviously, and then a lot of New Vietnamese uh, English speaking people also seek the help. And the Forms Clinic has been so great. It's been in existence for more than a decade now, and it's still something that members of the Tampa Hispanic Bar Association um, help with. And Trish, I know you and I have talked a little bit about these little uh, kind of education workshops uh, that have been going on to sort of educate people who are Hispanic about, uh, you know, all kinds of things, how to open a bank account, um, right? How, how, to, um, how, how to navigate through the courts. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, the Tampa Hispanic Bar Association recently started a series called Tayanis, basically little workshops that assist clients in various aspects of their lives. For example, how to open a bank account or what to do if you're pulled over and you don't have a driver's license, how to navigate the immigration system, things that they can do on their own that they wouldn't know how to do without a little bit of guidance. So attorneys volunteer through the Hispanic Bar Association and record short videos that we put out in the community under different topics. Some are in English, most are in Spanish, but that way it gives them a little bit of guidance on different aspects that they can search and look for and get some sort of help. Uh, so maybe you could, uh, Trish, uh, describe your practice. My practice is mainly business litigation and some construction. I also do some criminal defense. It leads to that through some of my construction practice. A lot of my Hispanic clients end up in situations where they come from their country. They're used to doing construction projects there, roofing, flooring. And when they get here and continue that practice, they unfortunately realize that they need a license to do that. So they end up in situations where they're not paid. They didn't have a contract with the homeowner to do the work because they didn't know they needed that. Culturally, a lot of times they do things as friends on handshakes and not necessarily through written contracts. So I end up assisting them in issues with not being paid and if they end up in any criminal trouble for doing work without a license. And then they end up leading to future clients of mine to be able to help them either obtain their license or do work that they're able to do and have actual written contracts to do that work. And Clara, uh, you don't practice construction. Uh, you have a sort of a different practice. Can you describe your practice? Sure, so my practice is mostly real estate based and collection uh, law. And within collection, I do help individuals with bankruptcy. With regards to real estate, I receive lots of phone calls where a buyer has lost their deposit because they weren't able to obtain financing. So we discuss the financing contingency. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times my, my, these clients rely so much on their realtors to you know, basically guide them through these purchase and sale agreements that uh, sometimes the realtors are not, you know, they're not attorneys and they're not advising the client, hey, you know, you need to seek an extension of this contingency. Um, and it just ends up in, in, a, uh, in a problematic situation where they are losing their deposit. Um, and I just under, I have to explain to them, you know, the realtor isn't an attorney in these transactions. It's, it's wise for you to seek out the services of a lawyer because we read a, a we, I'm sorry, we read contracts and we can tell you, you know, what deadlines you have to comply with. Um, so there's a lot of that situation out there in the Hispanic community that they're not really sure, um, even though they sign English contracts, they they don't understand them a lot of the time. And have you noticed uh, 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 that, uh, you know, in, in, in particularly in Spanish countries in Latin America and in Spain, there's a sort of a formality in signing a contract in front of a notary, a notaire, who's almost like a lawyer in civil law countries. And we don't have that here. And have you noticed that some of your clients, they'll go into a realtor's office and they won't understand that signing a contract in a realtor's office has the same kind of formality in the United States. There's a, a sort of a cultural disconnect. Have you seen that? I've seen that, yes. I think that the lack of formality for them um, may, may reduce the effect of the terms of the contract, but that really doesn't 
uh, affect the terms of the contract, they're still signing um, a valid binding legal agreement. They sign it electronically and, and yet they don't know, and they, they don't understand. And, and mind you, the contract's 12 pages long. I wouldn't probably, if I were them and not an attorney, sit there. But I think that, um, that the lack of formality definitely is, is a little confusing for them. And we've had this discussion in the Bar Association that some people may confuse the word notary, notario, for an attorney. And that's part of the education that we as a bar have to uh, provide the differences because a notary is not an attorney. And, and that is a really important difference so that people aren't, you know, getting confused or notary perhaps trying to practice practice of law. Right. And now you have offices in Tampa and also over in Jupiter. So I thought that was fascinating that uh, you've been able to open up a second office over there. How did that come about? Yes, John. I mean, that was um, sort of like, let's see how it goes. And it's gone well. <laughs> Um, in 2014, I moved from Tampa to Jupiter for uh, family reasons, and I thought I would have to close Tampa down because I wasn't there in person. Um, however, Tampa continues to be my main hub. Most of my clients are there, and I've been so busy with Tampa, I haven't really gotten a chance to um, garner business around here where I actually live in Jupiter. Um, but it's been uh, good. We have two telephone numbers and um, sometimes, you know, we try to use the right letterhead depending on the case that we're on. So it does require a little bit more uh, thought, but uh, it's definitely manageable. Right. And, and Trish, your, your office is physically located in the Latin Quarter of Tampa in Ybor City. Everybody associates that, Ybor City, with the Latin Quarter, even though we have another Latin, old Latin area uh, with Tampa, as they say, uh, but uh, did, did being in Ybor City, does that, did that help you um, build your practice? Yes, I think so. A lot of people know where my office is. If I tell them it's in Ybor City or right behind the Columbia, the staple of Ybor City, everyone can find my office very easily. And, uh, and how did you end up building a, a, a practice that's, that's uh, primarily uh, Hispanic? A lot of referrals, private um, previous clients I get referrals from, and they usually need something else. Like I said, a client that had a contracting issue will then ultimately want to talk to me about moving forward and doing the right thing and having the right contracts in place. I get a lot of referrals from other attorneys that don't speak Spanish, that may have a client that needs someone that speaks Spanish. And the Hispanic Bar Association is great with referrals. If there's a different practice area that someone doesn't necessarily do and they have someone that speaks Spanish, we refer within our association association to other attorneys that speak Spanish. Well, that's a good point because Clara uh, actually called on me recently to, to uh, discuss a lien question. So I helped her, walked her through that. Uh, so we do have a great referral network in the Hispanic Bar Association. And Clara, how did you build uh, your practice? You do a little advertising, right? I do, yes. I um, do a couple of things. At the very beginning, I joined a lot of networking groups with Hispanic uh, business owners. And that was a really great start. It, it allowed me to go out there in the community. People met me. Um, and another, um, becoming president of the Tampa Hispanic Bar Association was um, a great exposure. I became president in 2011. So I guess it's been 10 years already, but um, I got to meet a lot of people. I, I must say, I don't know how it is in other cities um, around the U.S., but the collegiality that you see in Tampa is, uh, is amazing. I think that the attorneys here really uh, help each other. There's not a lot of, you know, this uh, animosity between us and, and belonging to the Tampa Hispanic Bar just increased that because not only did we share, you know, that we all practice, but we also um, shared our culture. Um, so as part of the Bar Association will have, you know, salsa dancing uh, as a sample. So it's really great to be able to partake with that, share your culture with your colleagues. Um, and otherwise, radio, I did some radio advertising and mostly word of mouth. 
you know, once you help someone and they feel like you did a good job, then they, they bring their family and friends. I did notice that, you know, we have a lot of Hispanic lawyers who do personal injury work and they're everywhere in West Tampa. There are billboards everywhere, right? And even, even uh, benches, uh, uh, bus stop benches, uh, have uh, folks that are in our Hispanic Bar Association. Uh, so far, I haven't seen you guys on billboards or, uh, or bus stops. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, maybe someday you'll be on Estrella TV, which uh, for all of you who, who don't know is our Tampa Hispanic um, t TV station. It's located right here in Tampa and has a, a whole bunch of funny programs. Um, but um, let's talk a little bit about challenges in representing you know, Hispanic clients, because uh, I, I've seen it even uh, in my own practice with some of our clients. Uh, you know, uh, Trish, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, some of my clients don't necessarily want to meet me in my office in such a formal setting. They would rather go to lunch or meet for a cafe con leche and discuss their case to keep it a little bit more informal. Also, I seek out mediators, for example, that speak Spanish. It's a little bit easier to have a mediator that can speak directly to my client and understand without having a translator or some translation to take up time and maybe something gets lost in that translation. So to be able to have that direct communication, my client feels heard. They feel like they have a voice and that they can actually speak in that setting. So I think that helps as well. So I think depending upon the client, you have to seek out these different ways of representation. And, and Clara, have you noticed uh, you know, some challenges with cultural differences? Yes, certainly. There's, um, there are a lot of challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges, just the cost of involving translation in every proceeding that, that is required from a, just a, a legal court case. Um, if you think about it, depositions need to be translated, court hearings if there's testimony, um, you know, great mediation. Um, if if uh, you can get a bilingual mediator, that saves a lot of time. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that the translators are not cheap. So these clients are actually having to put more out of pocket to pursue their cases. Um, and other challenges, I would say that a lot of formalities are probably ignored um, as part from the Hispanic clients. Maybe they will do deals on a handshake. Um, I've read contracts in Spanish signed in Florida, more than a dozen of them. And it just still bewilders me that people who live in the United States are, are entering into Spanish contracts. I guess I do so myself and my retainers, but um, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's part of the practice. Um, other cultural differences, when they come to the office, they want to bring their family, their friends, everybody wants to be in the case. And I have to explain to my client, um, you know, make sure that the confidentiality is going to be broken if you've got all these people in, in the meeting with you. Um, a lot of times they'll need a little bit more hand holding. Um, I'll send them a letter and they don't read it. So they're calling my office to ask what the letter says. Um, and some of them are not tech friendly. Um, so there's just a lot of, you know, differences in, in managing the Hispanic clients. And what I try to do from the onset is just set expectations. Um, I'll tell them, listen, you know, the easiest way to contact us is through email or text. Uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So that way they're not, you know, kind of wondering, you know, what, what happens or, or how to manage that relationship between the attorney and the client. You know, I had a case in uh, Chile where the, um, where the clients were, were from uh, Santiago. And the, um, the other side was from Canada. And they had originally the contract in Spanish, then they translated it to English. And then if you looked at the two translations, there were some significant differences. <laughs> Whoever did the trans, have you noticed that? That, that you know, that's, a, that's an issue where you've got a contract signed, two contracts signed by, by the parties, one in Spanish, one in English, and they don't match. The terms don't match because of the translation. Have you seen that? I mean, not particularly that issue, but I've seen translators not translate correctly. And as, as uh, you know, fluent uh, it, attorneys, we try to catch them. Um, and 
with the translation, I mean, it just, it, it, it's a whole nother field because as you know, in Spanish, there is probably two or three different ways to say something. Um, each country has its own dialect. Um, and so it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. I think that the point, the main point gets across, but a lot of the actual uh, context maybe is lost in translation. And Trisha, have you, noticed, uh, have you noticed in your practice that, um, that individuals don't seem to want to make decisions? It has to be a family decision, a collective decision. Have you, have you noticed that cultural issue? Absolutely. If you tell a client they want to go talk to their entire family, their parents, their brothers and sisters, their cousins, and then they will get back to you, especially if you're running a settlement offer or something like that by them, they want to make sure that they have the approval of the entire family. And a lot of times they'll even call me and ask me, can you speak to my mom? Can you explain this to my sister before we make a decision? So yes, they do want to involve the entire family to make that ultimate final decision. Now, I want to talk a little bit next about the disparate uh, treatment of Hispanic clients, um, uh, sometimes by opposing counsel, but also by the courts. And we're fortunate here for all of you on the call in Tampa to have a cadre of Hispanic uh, judges uh, who were, you know, who are second and third generation uh, born in, many of them born in Tampa, who are fluent in at least Cuban Spanish, which is not the, the best of you know, Spanish, um, Colombians, the best Clara. And, uh, but anyway, but the, um, but at least they speak Spanish. Have you noticed though, however, that uh, Trish in the courts, cause you're in, in court all the time, uh, that the judges even are, are Latin judges are sometimes, you know, not the most patient with, with having to go through all of the, you know, the, the interpretation, you know, the translation. Have you noticed that? I do, and I think it's patience. It's not discriminatory or anything like that. I think the judges on our bench are very open and respectful. I think when they have very long dockets and every word needs to be translated, there has to be long pauses. So they can only say a sentence at a time to have it interpreted. I think it's frustrating at times. And I think it's a patience issue. So maybe testimony gets cut a little bit short or they don't necessarily want to hear any more about the case because of the time that it's taking. And it might not have been properly sat on the docket for a long enough period of time. So I think it's down to a patience and not maybe a discriminatory issue. Okay. And, and you haven't noticed any implicit bias, have you, towards Hispanic clients, Trish, when they're in court? No, I don't think so. Definitely not here in our county. I think here in the Tampa Bay area, we have such a diverse bench that I think our clients are treated very, very fair by the judges here. Well, that's good to hear. And Clara, uh, you do a lot, I think, with opposing counsel and negotiating real estate contracts and things or, or when they get issues over interpretation of them. Uh, have you noticed any, any issues with opposing counsel uh, because your clients are, are Hispanic? You know, I really have not uh, encountered such issues. Um, I think that I've had pretty good experiences. Um, I haven't felt any sort of bias on their part. Um, uh, and I think that people, I mean, maybe Florida being such an international destination, we really um, have become that state, um, are, are more um, accepting, at least probably Orlando line south. Um, not sure about North Florida, I think it's different up there. <laughs> but um, I haven't really experienced any at, you know, anything negative, I would say, by opposing counsel in any negotiations or, or anything like that. Um, I had to send opposing counsel some text messages um, once and they were in Spanish and I had to translate them beforehand. So I think that's a little strange for opposing counsel that probably doesn't speak the language, um, but um, I, it, those are the things that I deal with on a daily basis. And, and have you noticed any uh, either uh, uh, explicit or implicit bias uh, against you because you're a, a woman attorney? No, not myself. I haven't really had any negative experiences in that sense. Uh, thankfully, I think that, um, you know, with all my proceedings and my 12 years of practice, I, I really haven't experienced any of that. And hopefully um, it will remain that way. 
And Trish, uh, have you noticed anything like that? Uh, because you're a woman and a woman representing Hispanics, uh, uh, any, any issues that you've seen? Personally, I have not. Um, I think here again, our bench is so diverse. We have probably somewhere near 50% or so of our judges are female. So I think that that we're treated in court very respectfully due to the nature of our bench being so diverse. I think it does happen. You hear stories of colleagues having some issues with being treated different as a woman. So I'm not saying that it doesn't happen at all, but I think that I've been very fortunate or maybe I just didn't take it so personal or realize that it was happening to me. But personally, I have not experienced anything negative from being a woman. And I think we're fortunate that we have, um, you know, a uh, Hispanic woman on the federal bench who's active in our Hispanic Bar Association. And uh, that's, been a, that's been a real plus, I think, for all of us. Uh, and our U.S. attorney is Mexican-American. So we do have a, you're right, we have a rather diverse, um, um, you know, bar uh, society here in Tampa. And I think maybe that, that sort of helps. Um, because we have, you know, um, you know, women in very powerful positions. I think Judge Covington is probably going to end up becoming chief judge here soon, don't you think? And um, so anyway, she certainly has earned that uh, right. Yeah, and uh, it's Hernandez Covington for people saying, how could she be Hispanic with the name Covington? But anyway, so um, let's talk a little bit about what we can do as a society and as lawyers for Hispanics involved in the legal process. And we touched on a little bit with the little, uh, with the little recordings we're doing, uh, you know, in the Hispanic Bar Association. What else, uh, Clara, do you think we can be doing um, as a society and as lawyers uh, to help Hispanics through the, you know, through the, the legal process? I think that when you think of access to the court or the court system, uh, the word access perhaps may mean that we have to provide translation services, not only to Hispanics, but to all those who, who don't understand the language. When I appear at a 341 meeting of creditors for my bankruptcy cases, a translator is always available. And I just really enjoyed the fact that I can say to my client, don't worry, you know, these questions that are under, are under oath will be translated. I know additional costs to you. Um, so I think translation, not only of proceedings, but possibly documents. I know some of our summons come in several different languages, just so the person can understand the effect of the lawsuit and the summons. Um, so those are things that I would consider just providing more access to the community um, so that they can understand these concepts in their own language. Mm -hmm. And, and Trish, what, what, uh, what do you see as something that we can be doing as a society and as lawyers to help Hispanics through the process, the legal process? I think education is a big thing. I think letting them know that lawyers are out there in many different areas of practice to help them, that it not maybe as expensive as they think to have a consultation to at least get an idea of what they may need that it's much cheaper to talk to an attorney at the beginning than after the problem arises by throwing the papers in the trash doesn't make it go away asking for help and also that their immigration status doesn't necessarily matter. They're afraid to speak up if they're not being paid because they may not be citizens and they're afraid to ask for help. They're afraid to go to the court as a witness because their status. And a lot of times their status will never come into play. So I think just educating them on the different ways that they can participate in proceedings and the help that's out there and available for them. You know, we've had a real issue during the pandemic with the migrant population. We have a large for those of you on the call and don't know this, we have a large migrant population in Southern Hillsborough County, uh, where, where Tampa sits in, in the middle of Hillsborough County. But in the Southern portion, we've got a lot of farms and we have a lot of uh, Mexican, um, primarily Mexican farm workers. And so we had a real issue you know, with, uh, with um, uh, people getting infected uh, down that way. And there, there was a great outreach, uh, both among lawyers and doctors. Uh, to get down there and explain to folks that their immigration status didn't matter. They needed to, you know, we needed to do something for them and they needed to get, um, you know, get their shots. And uh, so 
that, that's certainly one thing that we can do. Um, and, you know, even as lawyers, even though that's primarily a medical issue, but do, have you noticed any change in your, in your practice, Clara, during the pandemic, um, you know, because, um, uh, because of COVID, um, it, it, are you doing more Zoom and more telephones? And is that more difficult with Spanish speaking clients? You know, I did notice a difference because Spanish speaking clients usually want to come and see you in person um, and they, they want to look at your face um, and uh, rightly so, uh, they should be able to do that. But, you know, when the pandemic hit, I was doing previously a lot of phone consultations, um, but that just increased. Um, for instance, I have a portal in my Tampa office that I do video conferencing with so that people can see me in person. Um, the, the person that's in my Tampa office is a paralegal and she facilitates everything for me. Um, they bring documents, they get scanned. I can see them immediately. So I think that maybe I was a little bit ahead of the game because I transferred my practice basically to my home um, and before the pandemic hit. And this honestly just made it a little bit easier for me. Um, however, I will say that there is no, um, there is no substitute for meeting with a client in person. I, I gather a lot more. I can see their face. They can see me. So I, uh, even though it did make things a little bit easier on my end, I still need to, you know, emphasize the fact that we need to meet with people in person in a conference room so that we can discuss the case. And, and believe it or not, things come about that are lost in, in telephone and, and video calls. And Trisha, have you noticed any difference in your practice because of the pandemic? Uh, particularly, you know, Hispanic clients always want to meet over, uh, you know, the, as you said, the cafe con leche and the, the pan de mantequilla, you know, and I've had that happen during the pandemic. They've wanted to go have breakfast, you know, or lunch at Arco Iris, our favorite Cuban restaurant here. Even during the pandemic, you know, we wore masks, but we, we were there physically. Have you noticed that? Exactly, yes. Uh, when restaurants were closed, I do have an espresso machine in my office. So I think I stayed very busy during the pandemic. And I think one of the reasons was that I still did in-person meetings with clients who absolutely wanted to do them. I have a very large conference room that we were able to accommodate social distancing and things like that, but they really wanted to come in and I accommodated them. And I think I ended up getting a lot of business from maybe some attorneys that weren't doing in-person meetings and the client just really wanted in person. So I stayed very very busy and meeting with clients in person throughout. It's funny you should mention espresso machine because at about three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, when we were physically in the office with our, and I had Hispanic clients, I would make a a cuartadito, you know, a little quarter, a little quarter coffee as we call it, and uh, you know, it's a pick me up in the afternoon. But it's a cultural thing, right? It's it's something that if you represent Hispanic clients, you sort of have to understand that cultural uh, connection. And uh, so let me ask you a little bit about where you think the future of the practice is going, you know, for women attorneys first, and then secondly, for, you know, attorneys such as yourself who are representing primarily Hispanic clientele. So Clara, where do you, where do you see the future going? I mean, John, I think that given the fact that I'm positioned in the areas of Florida that have the most Hispanics, I think that naturally there's just going to be a higher demand, a higher demand for Spanish speaking attorneys um, to, to basically under, not understand, but explain legal terms to Hispanics where otherwise they wouldn't be able to get any other explanation. Um, and I think that even the future generations of these newly arrived immigrants are still going to seek a familiar face, perhaps, um, that, you know, if mom and dad sought the services of a Hispanic attorney, maybe I'm willing to do the same just because I feel more comfortable or, you know, whatever other reason. And um, I think that the future for us as attorneys is just helping to navigate uh, a foreign uh, person in a in a U.S. 
uh, law legal system. Um, and it's, it's challenging at times because people don't understand it. Um, I would like to, you know, for all Hispanics to be, um, you know, more, more uh, understanding in what we're dealing with because we're, we're basically being teachers to these folks. Um, and some understand it and, and it's a, some it's a little harder. So I think uh, for us, we are here to stay. Um, I speak to my children in Spanish um, solely because I understand the value of the knowing this language because it really does open up a whole other area for us. And, and Trish, same question. Um, you know, um, the, where do you see the future of the practice going? I know your practice is, is going great, right? Personally for you. Uh, but where, where do you see it? Where do you see it going? Uh, I, I think it's going to continue to grow. I think the demand is there. Even if the clients speak English, they feel more comfortable speaking in their first language or maybe the language that they communicate with their parents in. There may be a few words, even if they want to speak to you in English, that they may not be able to know or use or understand well in English. And they, it's just easier for them to explain the problem to you in Spanish. So I think having an attorney that can understand their language makes them feel more comfortable. They may have a different level of trust. Maybe not initially, but after talking to you a little while, they end up trusting and will share the necessary information that you need to effectively represent them. So I think that it's just going to continue to grow and that the need and the demand is there for attorneys that speak other languages, not just Spanish, but a language that will be able to speak to the client in their native language. And Trish, I'll start with you on this. What, what do you think our priorities should be? Uh, in, uh, as a bar, as a bar association in ensuring, you know, fair treatment of Hispanics in the legal uh, system. Do you think, for example, it would help if we had in the state court system um, uh, what we have in, in federal bankruptcy court with, with a translator who's there uh, paid for by the court system? Would that help? Absolutely. That is the case in criminal law, but in civil law, it's not. And that's a bar to a lot of people. They do not have the finances or resources to be able to afford an interpreter. So that may limit them on what they're willing to file or how many evidentiary hearings they're going to have or their participation. You may be able to have a hearing, but they won't testify because they cannot afford the interpreter. So I think access to courts, having a voice that they're able to feel that they're being heard and just education, having attorneys understand the challenges that they're facing, opposing counsel to understand the cost of a translator, for example, having people speak slowly when there's an interpreter so the interpreter can keep up and the client can understand the entire proceeding and not just a summary. So overall, just education of attorneys on those issues and education to the clients that they understand that there are attorneys that speak their language, there are access to courts for them, their programs out there through not just our bar association, but Bay Area Legal Services and other nonprofits that can help them if they don't have the funds. Well, that's true. You know, we do have St. Michael's Legal Clinic, which we have a large uh, Catholic church here that's unusual in the sense that it's got a very, very, very wealthy uh, demographic in the church. And it has its own full-time legal clinic at the church, which is quite quite amazing. They never call on me because they never seem to have construction issues. But uh, uh, but you're right. We do have not only the Hispanic Bar Association, but we have this other, um, you know, full-time legal clinic. Um, and, you know, we have Bay Area Legal Services. Of course, they've got that income limit at Bay Area, which is, you know, uh, which sometimes is a bar to getting services because we have people that, you know, can't afford a lawyer, but they can't, they're not poor enough to qualify for, you know, for Bay Area. So maybe there's something else in between, uh, sort of like St. Michael's, which doesn't have that, that financial uh, requirement that maybe we can do. Plus, it gives an idea that maybe we should, in the Hispanic Bar Association, be pushing our chief judge to see if we can get funds for a translator, a full-time translator in civil, in civil courts. Uh, that would certainly certainly be helpful. And Clara, is there something else you think that we could be doing uh, as a as a bar association? Um, you know, to sort of help uh, this this I know great influx now, influx now of new new Hispanic immigrants into the Tampa area. Yes, I think that um, providing them with resources is what we can do individually in each of our offices. 
Um, when a client calls me, you know, recently with the pandemic, there's been a lot of tenants who have lost their jobs and can't pay rent. And um, I get help from a colleague of mine in Bayer Legal Services who gives me all of these resources to be able to apply for rental assistance. So I take the time and either email the list of organizations and these resources just so that I can provide some guidance to the people who are suffering in this case. Um, otherwise, connecting them to other Spanish-speaking attorneys, that is the main question. Does the attorney speak your language? Because if it, if it wasn't that way, I could easily refer to anybody, and, and that's not the case. Um, and also, um, putting them in contact with all of these programs, Bay Area, uh, any free legal resources, um, because they are out there, but we have not gotten taken the time to discover it so that we can then convey and help others with it. So do you sometimes show you're both a lawyer and, and sort of a social worker as well? <laughs> yeah, I that, definitely that, feel like that. <laughs> and that's a cultural, that's a cultural difference for sure. Uh, well, we're almost at the very end. Uh, of the program because we try to uh, stop these at two o'clock on the nose. Uh, we made that commitment. So we have a few minutes left. So in those few minutes, uh, I want you both to, to, to talk a little bit about the fun things we do in the Hispanic Bar Association. Domino's night being my favorite, by the way, Trish, at your place. Uh, but uh, let's, we had a just, a, a, I missed it, but we had a, a big scholarship uh, dinner the other night at, um, Palmasia Country Club, right? And um, and tell us a little bit about that. We give scholarships. Uh, the Hispanic Bar Association raises money throughout the year to give scholarships to students, um, Hispanic students that are seeking to further their education and just not able to. So we tried to mix the scholarships with a little bit of fun. So at the Pamacia Country Club, we had a scholarship presentation along with a cocktail hour and hors d'oeuvres and things like that. A guitar player to play some Spanish music for us during that time. We also do a series called Baile THBA. It's a dance class once a month. It's a hybrid event due to COVID. So we have some in person with a dance instructor that teaches us one night salsa, one night bachata. And then people can join online as well for the class. We do that along with um, this month is tacos and margaritas. Um, so we do a lot of fun events like that. And we also coordinate with other bar associations, the Women's Bar Association. Um, we do what's called Salsa, Soul and Sass. So we have three local bar associations that come together and put on an event every summer. That's just a fun dinner and dancing. So throughout the year, we try to do things that are not just in the legal world, but also with a little bit of fun. And Clara, I noticed that when you were president, you reached out, I, I know you did, to the African American Bar Association, the George Edgecombe Bar Association. We had some joint events and we did some joint sponsorships with them. And that I, I, that worked out, I think, tremendously well. I always go to their annual banquet. They always, you know, when they were having them, they always had great speakers. Uh, so a, a, have you noticed that there's a uh, sort of a, 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 among the diverse bar associations, a sort of, a, a, you know, a, a, a feeling that, you know, we're better as one than we are divided? Yes, certainly. And uh, we would uh, not only join with uh, GIBA, but also the Asian Bar Association. Um, and it's just nice to be able to all of us join because I think that we're here um, on the same similar level. Um, and it's, it's nice to be able to um, meet the president and see what they're doing in the Bar Association so that we can, you know, grab some ideas and implement them on, their, on our own. Um, and the Tampa Hispanic Bar is an excellent organization. If you want more information, I think that they're look, we're looking for members. So feel free to reach out to us. Well, thank you so much, both of you. I owe you lunch at, uh, at the Columbia, uh, our favorite restaurant. As you know, Trisha and I go there occasionally. Uh, so when you're in town, Clara, let me know. So anyway, and Arlen, thank you. And I want to thank Nick for envisioning this phenomenal program, which I've been listening to for, you know, uh, every chance I can get every once a month uh, and for giving me the opportunity to put this together for us. So thank you. Great. I want to thank you, John, Patricia and Clara for an excellent discussion today. Uh, and thank you all for joining us today. Our next diversity and inclusion brunch session will be on Thursday, May 20th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Eastern. 
And our guest speaker will be Angela Onwachi Willig, Dean of the Boston University School of Law. Now, Dean Onwachi Willig is a renowned legal scholar and expert in racial and gender inequality, as well as civil rights law. She will discuss her own experiences, as well as what can be done to enhance diversity and inclusion in the legal profession. Our own Sanjay Kurian will moderate the discussion. So we ask that you mark your calendars and join us next month. Until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you.